Good afternoon. So let's start the lecture by finishing off a little bit about um, sets of functions. Last time we talked about functions, we need to talk about sets of functions as well. And then after that, the main topic for today is talking about transitive sets. So if you turn to uh, page 14, there in the text, I'll look at definition first 127 and then 128. So, recall we thought of a function as being a set of ordered pairs and we're going to have, we want to consider all a set of all functions. So a function f from x to y this is a set of ordered pairs x, y, so that if y prime is different from y, y prime in y, then x, y prime is not in f. So it's a single valued relation. So this is all recall. <clears throat> so definition 127 gives a name for the collection of all functions from X to Y. And I'll restrict to sets here. Then Y to the X we're actually written with a X as a pre superscript of Y. We're going to define that to be just the collection of things that are functions and F goes from X to Y. So it's just a bit of um, nomenclature for the set of these functions here. <laughs> Does a special kind of function that's often very useful, where we think of the domain of the function as being an index set. And then the range of the function gives me a sequence of sets ordered by that index set. So I can think of this as an indexed Cartesian product. So let I, I standing for I the index, index set here. And we suppose we've got for each I and I, each little I, there is a set A sub I. So I'm using the little I's to index this collection of A's here. <laughs> and we'll suppose these are all non-empty. And what we're going to define is this big product. So there's a big capital pi here over the index set of the AIs. <clears throat> and we're going to define this to be, this will be the set of functions whose domain is I 
And for all little i's, f of i is a member of a sub i. This was why we required the a sub i's to be non-empty. Right? So there's always something that it can pick out. So a picture of this would be Here's a typical AI. So here's the collection of the AIs. And a function F in this generalized Cartesian product is so-called a choice function. What does it do? It chooses just one element out of each of the AIs. So a typical element of this Cartesian product is a choice function. So it chooses, metaphorically speaking, chooses f of i from AI. So I can think of it also as F is kind of a thread through all of the A's. So this notation will be useful to us later here. And the examples given are kind of standard, standard mathematical things, which hopefully you're familiar with. Right? So we often index things using the set of natural numbers. But in this case, let's suppose take each of the AIs to be the same, to be the reals. Then an element in the Cartesian product in the F in this Cartesian product It's essentially an omega, a sequence of real numbers. And so on. And I can write F0, F1, F2 because I specified in this particular case that I use the natural numbers. But there is no reason to think of the index set as being ordered. Right? We've got a natural ordering on the natural numbers, so we think of this as being like a sequence. But this I could be a quite general set in the definition of the, the Cartesian product here. This could be any set at all. So it doesn't have to be a nicely ordered set. It gives us just a way of indexing the, these AIs. So the second example is, let GI be a group. For each I in the set I, whatever that might be. Then each, each GI is a group with its own group identity inverse and group multiplication. But it's possible to define a group. I shan't spend time doing it, but it is possible to define a group structure on this Cartesian product. And we would call this the product group or the direct product group of the GIs here.
Okay. Good. Any questions about that? I'm going to go on to 1.4 next. Okay. Doug. Constant sets. So a transitive set, I think of as one as <clears throat> it doesn't have any gaps or holes in it. Right? So some cheeses have holes in it and some cheeses don't. <clears throat> so a set could have some like epsilon holes. It there may be members of members of the set that aren't there. Or <clears throat> members of members of those things that aren't there. A transitive set you can think of as a set without any, I mean, I just call it epsilon holes. So we could have a set X and some Y in X. <clears throat> but there might be some Z's in Y with Z not in X. So although X has got Y as a member, there are members of Y that aren't in X. These are missing. So somehow X has incomplete information about its members. It's not full. A transitive set isn't like this. It would say if Y is a member, X has got information about all of Y's members. In other words, Y will be a subset of X. So this is the main definition then, then for today. So set X is transitive. And so we'll write here trans X. If for any y in x, y is actually a subset of x. So there's some points to be made here. This is equivalent to saying <laughs> big union of X is a subset of X. Right, and the little bullet point below, which we'll do now, actually explains why this is the case. Right? And again, it's really just an exercise in the definitions. We'll show, we'll show, sorry, we'll show that this is equivalent to this. So this is just renamed as trans X. Right? Okay, this is the set of elements of elements of X. So if Z is a member of Y is a member of X, in other words, Z is in here, an element of an element of X, Then, oh, sorry, I'm in the notes, I've written the X's and the Y's. Let me, let me stick with what's in the notes so as not to confuse yourselves or me. Pick Y, an element of an element of X here. 
Now, by transitivity, Z is a subset of X. Z is a subset of X. We have Y's in X. But Y was just a typical element of this big union. Conversely, if we assume that, we'll show X is transitive. So then, suppose Y is a member of X, By definition, a big union of X, Y is a subset of big union of X. But this is contained in X. So Y is a subset of X, and that's what it means to be transitive. If you remember, you're a subset. Okay, so this first point is saying that this is equivalent to this. So instead of saying trans X sometimes, I'll just say this, and just leave that as understood. Another point is perhaps worth saying, it might not be immediately apparent, if, if we say X is transitive, we have all members of X as subsets. But of course that means actually all members of members of X are also subsets. Then for any y and x, and for any t and y, t is also a subset of x. Because I'm just applying the definition of transitivity again. If any y that's a member of x is a subset, then any t that's in y is also in x, by this. But again, x is transitive. So this actually is saying T is in X, so T is a subset of X. So I mean, it's a simple point, but it's worth, worth saying. <clears throat> okay, so we have some examples. Okay, our old friend and enemy, the empty set, right here, is, is always an example of everything because there's nothing in it, so any conditions you put on the set are satisfied automatically by every member of it because it has no members. So this again is vacuously or trivially. Right? Every element of this is a subset. <clears throat> because it has no elements. Okay, but this is also transitive because to be transitive, every element has to be a subset. Okay, it's only got one element, but the empty set is the subset of everything. So it's transitive. And this is transitive. Again, just check. Every element is a subset.
but this is not transitive. Because this set here has got one element here, but this is not, this set is not a subset of this because empty is not in there. And here's another one, which I won't say any more about. So these are both intransitive. <clears throat> okay, so then there are a number of facts that we can um, pull together about uh, transitive sets. So let's look at exercise 122. Just look at some of those properties. So let's look at part two. I'm going to assume X and Y are transitive. So a number of things to check. So we first check the successor of X is transitive. Now the successor of X we define, given the definition above, is X union singleton X. So it's, it's like X we've thrown in one more thing, the whole set itself. So the successor of the empty set is this. And the claim is if X is transitive, SX is transitive. So just look at the definition of what transitive means, right? It means that every element is a subset. So pick an, an arbitrary element. So there are two cases, either Y is a member of X or Y equals X. If Y is a member of X, then it's because X is transitive, it's a subset of X. Okay, but then Y is a subset of SX. So we need to show that members are subsets okay, to check transitivity. On the other hand, the other possibility is that Y is a member of this. Y equals X, but then trivially it's a subset of SX. Hence, SX is transitive. 
So this function will come back and see, we'll use this when we define the natural numbers and successors of natural numbers, we use this, this successor function. So exercise one, twenty two, three. So let X be a collection of transitive sets. It doesn't say X is transitive, it says all the members of X are transitive. Then show that this is transitive. Okay, so go back to the definition of what big union of X is. It's the members of members of X. Right. So solution here. Let Y be in big union of X. What do we want? We want that Y is a subset of the big union of X. So pick something in Y. So Y is a member of one of the things that are in X. There's some T in X and the things in X are all transitive with Y in T. As T is transitive, Y is a subset of T, but that's enough to put Z into T. So Z is in T. But that means Z is also like Y in big union of X. And Z was an arbitrary element of Y. So we've got this here. So that's that. Okay, any questions so far? We'll keep on looking at transitive sets for the rest of the rest of the day. <clears throat> okay. Let's uh, I'll mention this one. Half of it I've left as an exercise anyway. So there's another expression which is equivalent to X being transitive. It says the big union of S of X is X. So again, this is an exercise in big U and the definition of the successor function here. Okay, so what do we do? We first know what is big union of S of X? Well, this is big union of X union singleton X. Okay. Now from an earlier exercise, big union of A union B is big union A union big union of B. So 
So that is this. But this is the set of members of members of this. So actually this just comes down to X. Okay, so if we now start to do the proof, we assume X is transitive, but we've got an equivalent to this. That's equivalent to saying big union of X is a subset of X. So here we can use that on this line and just say that this is a subset of X. Big union of this subset, uh, big union of S of X is just contained in X. But also X is contained in big union of S of X. So I've got this sandwich between X and X. So we've got equality. And this direction is left as an exercise. So again, the exercise asks you to write something like this. I'm quite short. It's not, uh, shouldn't be too lengthy here. Now we want to talk about the transitive closure of a set. Somebody gives us a set, it's got epsilon holes in it. We want to fill out those epsilon holes and perhaps fatten up the set to make it transitive. We're going to look at the transitive closure of a set. So I said before, a set might be <clears throat> intransitive because we might have some here's x perhaps it's intransitive there's some y in here in x but y is not a subset of x so y is at least one of the things that's stopping x from being transitive because it has some elements that aren't in x so a natural thing to do if we wanted to find a transitive set that contains X is, well, we throw in those missing elements. We fatten up X by throwing in some extra elements, indeed all the elements of Y, <coughs> to make sure they're in there. So we could do the following then. So to find a superset of X, which is transitive. So we could fatten up X by adding in <coughs> um, all Z in Y for any y in x. In other words, add in union of x to x. <clears throat> Now, 
you might think that actually that's enough just to say that but it's not if you think about it because there'll be some z's in here in y that we've thrown in but who's to say that there aren't elements of z that are now not in this fattened up version of x Perhaps there are some Z in some Y, and some Y in X. Sorry, some with Z not a subset of X union. Big union of X. So we fattened up X by throwing in this big union of X. So then you can come back and say to me, well, OK, we'll throw in all of the elements of these z's as well. And indeed, that's the right thing to do. All those elements of such z. So I just take another big union of what I've got and add it in. <clears throat> so I throw in big union in the union of X. And of course, the same objection may arise. We haven't done enough. So we just take, uh, by, by an induction, we just define fatter and fatter sets by just taking, repeating this big union operation. So this gives me the definition of transitive closure. TC of X. So we define by a recursion big U superscript some natural number. Well, big U zero of X it will be just X itself. But big U N plus one of X will be big union, which we know what that is, applied to big UN of X. And the TC of X is going to be a collection of all of these things put together. Here. So you can think of TC of X as being X together with this, together with etc. That's what that is, except we don't have infinitely long formulae, right? So I can't really officially write this down, but I can write the above down, which is amounts to the same thing. So what we're doing is filling out the epsilon holes by doing this. And we can show kind of quite concretely what it is to be in big union N of X. Right? It means there's a chain of epsilon elements starting with X and ending on Y. It means I've got XN, XN minus one, all the way up to X1 here, where Y 
is in x1, which is in x2, which is in dot, 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 which is in, um, oh, I've numbered them in the other way around, xn, xn minus one, which is a member of x1, and which is a member of x here. So I've got an epsilon chain of n intermediaries between x and y. And that's what to be in big union n, n of x is. Now notice the construction is we've got that this is a transitive set. So first note. Transitive TC of X is transitive. Because to be in TCX means you're in one of these UN sets. And for some n, Y is in big union N of X. But to be in big union of N of X means Y is a subset of big union of big union of N of X. And this is big union N plus one of X here. And by design, this is one of the subsets that go into TC of X. This is a big union of all of these gadgets. So this is a subset of TCX here. So I took Y as a member and I found it as a subset. So this is a indeed transitive. And actually it's the least transitive set that contains X. We saw in an earlier exercise, if X, if some Z is some transitive set, so is the successor of Z. So if I can find some transitive set that contains X, there are going to be arbitrary many. But this TCX gives me the smallest one. And that's the content of the next lemma here. So this kind of lists together some properties of TCX. First of all, X is always a subset of TCX and TC of X is transitive. Second point is if T is transitive and X is a subset of T, then TC of X is contained in T. So TC of X is the smallest under containment set that contains X, which is transitive. So it's the smallest transitive set. containing X. Yeah. And we deduce from that, the third clause here. So if X is already transitive, that's equivalent to saying TC of X is X. Basically, we've got nothing else to add here. <clears throat> okay, so let's see how the proof here goes. We've already shown for any set that TCX is transitive. So this bit was already done here yeah, in the construction bullet point above. So the only concern is this, 
But this is because this is nothing to say here. Because X is one of the big unions. This was by definition of what U0 was. This is one of the unions that get unioned up into TCX. So there's nothing else to do there. So the interesting, interesting bit of the lemma is, is two. Okay, so we've assumed we've got a transitive T which contains X. So if X is a subset of T, then big U zero of X is a subset of T, trivially, because they're the same things here. And we'll show by induction, big union of K is a subset of, big union K, of X is a subset of T. So by induction on K, assume this here is a subset of T and we'll show it for K plus one. So we now use the fact that If I've got that A is contained in B and B is transitive, then big union of A is contained in B. So if you're still not used to this big union symbol, check, check, check this out, right? Make sure that uh, you understand this. So we use this to deduce, here's a transitive set, here's a subset, so this will be my B, this will be my A here, big union of K plus one of X, big union of big union of K of X here, this will be a subset of T. So this was my A and this was my B in the above. So with the assumption that this was a subset, so is the next one. So as TC is the union of all the big union Ks, we get what we want. TC of X is a subset of T. So T was any arbitrary transitive set that contains X. And we've shown that TC of X is a subset of that transitive subset. So this is going to be the smallest subset. So then finally for three, X is contained in TCX anyway, right? So if X is transitive, right? We're going to get the TCX equals X. So if X is transitive, I can substitute X for T in here in two, right? Because here, if X is transitive, I could say transitive X, X is a subset of X clearly. So TC of X is contained in X. So they're the same thing. So if X is transitive, I'm going to have TC of X is X here. So 
So that will be the direction from here. But this direction is trivial because we've already shown that this is transitive. So if this equals this, obviously x is transitive. So we're done on the lemma. What's the word after by induction on K? Assume. Sorry. <laughs> 